Um, I thought first that you would introduce yourselves. Try not to take too much time since there's a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> you want to just tell us your names and where you're from and why sure. you're here? Or? Sure. My name's John and uh, I'm from Pittsburgh and uh, I, I came to my first pod camp, I think pod camp six or something, wandered around like a creepy old guy and Ow. learned a lot. And uh, I try to come back ever since because I always learn new things. John, what's your Twitter handle? I'm at yajagoff.com, or yajagoff. Okay. Yeah. John was the keynote speaker yesterday, so he sort of downplayed his, <laughs> <laughs> his role yesterday. <laughs> An agitator when the media panel was on. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we need agitators. <laughs> uh, I'm Carol Smith. I'm relatively new to Pittsburgh officially. I, I moved here this year, but uh, I've been around Pittsburgh for many years. My sister's lived here for a long time, and uh, I've worked with uh, local groups here before in the past, and so uh, I'm definitely an art fan. I, uh, my undergrad was in photography and I studied a lot of art, and I uh, actually worked with um, groups that use art as therapy. Um, so generally, those advocacy and art definitely go hand in hand. Not so much of a blogger, but the, mm -hmm. but the other parts are very interesting to me. Well, we hope that you'll learn today how these pieces fit together in a way that none of us were expecting. <laughs> Actually, Aaron and I weren't even on board when it started, so it's kind of an interesting uh, story. And I'm going to, we have our thing right now, <laughs> not in the background. This is a, a video that's related to the actual project that we're discussing today, which we'll keep playing so that you can see it all. But I turn the sound off because it's really good sound, so it would overwhelm us. But, <laughs> um, should we introduce ourselves now? Yeah, okay. So I'm Sue Kerr, and I blog at Pittsburgh Lesbian Correspondence. I've been blogging for uh, almost 10 years, um, and I'm also a social media support person, I like to say, and um, I'm a social worker by training, and I've been in the pod camp about six years now, so I'm an old hand. I have a lot of t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Erin Neinhauser. I'm the Education Outreach Director for the Pennsylvania Health Access Network. This is my first pod camp, so that's exciting. Um, I am on Twitter, and uh, so we're at PA Health Access on Twitter, and um, you know, we are real excited to work with this project and connect um, artists with uh, information about the Affordable Care Act to help folks get insurance. So, um, <laughs> welcome. Hi, thank you. No, that's fine. We just we just got started. So I help people get health insurance. Um, I work with the Pennsylvania Health Access Network. Uh, last year, we were a certified application counselor. This year, uh, we did such a good job um, that we got some navigator funding. So we're working in more areas across the state uh, to connect people up with information and insurance. Nice. Great. I'm Nina Sauer. I'm co-owner of Most Wanted Fine Art, and it's an art gallery in Garfield on Penn Avenue. And we joke that we are a community service organization disguised as an art gallery. Uh, we, we show art and we work with artists, but we also try to tie it back to the community and make it meaningful. So Nina's going to start with you. I'm sorry, you, ma'am who arrived late. <laughs> <laughs> Just for lack of not, I don't know what to call you. Would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, yeah. sure. And if folks don't mind telling you who they are, you know, I'm Gwen. Just returned back to DC after living in New York. Uh, DC. Um, this is Pittsburgh. I just returned <laughs> back to Pittsburgh, which is my hometown. After years of living um, first in Boston and then in New York for a long time in DC, and I've uh, just been back a few months and um, in the um, mental health field. But I do uh, a lot of communications work as well and. Um, my hobby is um, cartoons, telling cartoons, oh, other cartoons awesome. and other cartoons. And so I was really interested um, in art and blogging and putting cartoons up just because it's so timeliness, it's particularly political cartoons. Right. Can we just, you know, do something? I'm not affiliated with any um, newspaper or anything, so I was thinking putting it on some blog or something, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's probably way too much information. No, that's, <laughs> that's a, kind of why 
good crossover. Yeah. 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 So people, is that just for one word even? Yes. Say who you are, because I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. I'm, I'm Carol Smith. I, uh, I actually work um, on websites and do uh, user experience work um, at UPMC. Uh, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just here because I'm a big art and uh, advocacy person. And so it's a nice image. So. Cool. I'm John. I have uh, my real job is I have a marketing outreach company where we try to teach nonprofits how to do more effective outreach systems, and uh, including social media at this point. And uh, and I have a, a Pittsburgh blog uh, that I write that doesn't pay the damn bills, but <laughs> what do you write on? It's just sort of humorous stuff. Uh, it just sort of pokes fun at people embarrassing the rest of us. So. <laughs> <laughs> people that can't drive or bad, dumb criminals, things like that. So. Cool. Okay. And who are you? We're going to reintroduce ourselves oh, when we present, so okay. we'll, we'll get that. I'll get a. Uh, uh, Nina's going to start off and tell you about how the project started. Okay. The art part. The art part. So, um, most wanted fine art, as I said, we're trying to do art that centers around the community. And one way that we approached that this year was um, we started the Resident Artist Program, where we took 12 artists in the community who were had ideas for community service projects where their art would become an integral part in something. And we brought them on board and worked with them to make these events and stuff happen. Within that, we started working with Penn Avenue Eyewear, which is a local eyeglass company. And they were interested, they donate part of their proceeds, all their proceeds on their website. You go, you buy their glasses, and you can donate a percentage to different nonprofits in the area. And they were looking to expand. Like, how do they do more good work? How do they partner with artists? Because they felt like the artist was sort of their marketplace. So we started developing this idea. They had these wooden sunglass frames that were really nice. So we love them. I wear them all the time. So I got a bunch of artists to customize the glasses. And so we did this um, really simply with just the eyeglasses in a small way last year. So when this year came back and we had the resident artists and we had a larger group of people to pull from, we were able to expand it, do more glasses, and sort of try to make it a more meaningful event. So I, when trying to invite people to be part of it, we approached musicians, we approached a photographer, a videographer, not just visual artists, because we wanted to try to see how other people could interpret this. And as a trade for being part of the exhibit, Penn Avenue Eyewear gave these artists real eyeglasses. So they could get their prescription, they got the frames, they got all that for free in exchange for being part of this. So what they did is they took the glasses, they customized it, and they made a piece of art around the idea of eyewear. So, all of this together, when we were picking people, I picked Sue. I asked Sue if she would be interested in being part of this with us because what was missing the year before was some a storytelling aspect. Like, art is a story, and you are inviting people in, and I felt like there was no context. We didn't have, why are we doing this or anything like that. So, I was like, Sue, in my life, I saw her as an art and an advocate already. Like she's already out there writing about people's stories and about healthcare and I was like, Sue will know what to do. And <laughs> she did. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when Nina approached me, I was thinking, oh great, classes for blogging. That's good. I like to barter. You know? um, and it was a good cause and I thought, oh, this will, this will be great. And Typically, as a blogger, when I'm supporting a community event, I'm in a promotional capacity. So, you know, I do a nice post about it. Um, I try to add something interesting, but you know, get the details out there, and mostly just getting people to raising awareness that this event is happening. And then sometimes I attend the event, and I might do some sort of review or wrap-up or critique or something like that. But um, I've never in a million years thought of myself as an artist. I'm not a trained journalist. I'm not a writer. 
I refused to keep a journal when I was a child. <laughs> I um, I did a master's thesis on art and politics, so that's kind of odd that I don't have that. I didn't see myself that way, but I just thought of myself as a blogger. And what that meant was pretty pragmatic. And so when, you know, Nana and I were discussing this, I thought that a, a format that I really like to use, which is a Q&A format, a question and answer format. And I use that a lot with musicians that I interview. Um, some of the, when people are touring from the small venues, like Club Cafe and things like that, you know, I would have a chance to interview them. And, and I like the Q&A because I try to ask very interesting questions, but I allow them to, you know, it's amplifying their voice. I'm not filtering what they're saying. It's just, you know, I might edit for punctuation or something. But, and those go over really well. So I thought, oh, let's try that here. This will be kind of interesting. And boy, did I earn these glasses. <laughs> I had the Q&A with 12 people, which is a lot of work because of, you know, asking all the questions. But then also, there's a lot of editing involved and, and formatting and timing and promoting them and hashtags and spelling people's names and all that stuff. So, um, and so I put together some questions that I thought would be kind of interesting because, you know, obviously I want to ask them about their work. What are they planning to do? Uh, but I wanted to ask them about uh, their eye vision and things like that. And so, you know, I was really expecting a lot of answers along the lines of my experience. I got glasses when I was young. I was bullied because of that. And eventually, you know, I learned to appreciate having glasses and maybe something about cost. And that didn't really happen. There were just a couple of the artists who had similar, those similar experiences to me. Um, what I found were like all sorts of new trends that I did not expect. And, you know, for example, um, quite a few of them started to require glasses in their early 20s. And I didn't, you know, I, I've been wearing glasses since I was four. So I was like, wow, that's kind of odd. Um, then, you know, we were also talking about experiences as children, and, you know, most of them, were, you know, didn't really have negative experiences. And then I realized most of these artists are probably a decade or so younger than me, and so, you know, the, the four-eyed character, you know, you know, wasn't necessarily there. So, you know, all these interesting stories came up, and I was asking them, who, who inspired you with glasses as a child? And it's, it's very ironic, because mm -hmm. I think six out of 12 said Steve Urkel. <laughs> which, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is very interesting. Yeah. And then, you know, oh. so you know, so other things started to you know come through, and I was really rethinking um, my whole perspective on the, on this project and what it meant and why they were involved. But other things that came through um, were pretty serious health issues, really. So, for example, um, a lot of the artists understood the importance of eye care, eye health, we were calling it, vision health, but they did, even with insurance, they didn't have the resources they needed to get the things that they needed. So lots of stories of broken glasses, stretching contacts longer than they should, prescriptions expiring, which I didn't know that happened until I read this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one woman developed her vision change when she was pregnant, and her doctor told her it would be temporary, so she didn't buy glasses because she couldn't afford to buy glasses just for a pregnancy. And then when she gave birth, the condition remained. And so, you know, all these interesting stories came up. And I, and being the social worker <laughs> that I am, I was like, oh, Erin, you know, my friend Erin who works with the health access network, because surely we must, there must be programs and resources for people because, you know, this, this one-time gift of glasses is great, but there are issues that they're describing are systemic. Because if they broke those glasses or lost them, yeah, they'd be right back where they started from. And the other thing that came up was um, the Affordable Care Act, which some of us know as Obamacare. And, you know, people were talking about the fact that they didn't sign up for it because they didn't want to take charity or a handout or a welfare. You know, and I was shocked that I would just think of artists as these, like, super progressive politically lefty type things and you know and that was a that was a stereotype on my part because I was like what do you mean affordable care act is not a handout you know I didn't say that to anyone, but, but I immediately was like there's a real need for education here because you know all of these people have all you know they're all struggling with these issues around this and you know there's a lot of things about vision health that have nothing to do with glasses you know there's certainly 
you know, like people who have diabetes, you need to definitely make, you know, have, and, and some of these things are covered by medical insurance, not just vision insurance, but it's complicated, and you need help, and you need support, and I knew that the Pennsylvania Health Access Network was the kind of organization that would be willing to come in and meet artists where they were, and help them one-on-one -on -one as best as possible, get connected with things. So the first thing I did, I talked to Erin, and she <laughs> was interested, and, and Lina agreed to have Erin um, get involved in the project. So what I did to hand off is I did a, a wrap-up interview with Erin, a Q&A that was pretty extensive. Mm -hmm. It's like 15 questions. And she was explaining the whole history of medical and uh, d visual and dental health insurance. It was, again, really fascinating. I had never thought about why vision insurance was separate from health insurance and how that came about. So that really helped me be better prepared to, you know, sort of, advocate in general, but we also, you know, opened a pathway for Aaron to connect directly with the artists who needed this kinds of information, and so that's, I'll hand off to Aaron. Yeah, and um, and I was just really excited to be approached because it was a great, it was such a great um, project, and we're always looking to connect with people in the community that um, need information uh, and need support, because honestly, we all do. You know, most people um, are either in the camp where you've had insurance through your employer, you don't necessarily think about how it works, you just, you think about it when it doesn't work. Like when you thought something would be covered, or when you thought you'd go to a certain doctor, and then you can't, and then you go back and try to look through the fine print and figure out what's going on. And on the other end is, you know, folks that haven't ever had it, you know, and then it's just kind of like, well, what's the point, you know, maybe I'll go to the emergency room. More, more often than not, it's just, I'll just ride it out. You know, some people are lucky enough to seek out help at a local health center. Um, but in general, health insurance is something that's complex and kind of overwhelming and not real easy to get clear, concrete answers about. So I was really excited to have the opportunity to come and, and to talk to people. And the event was just wonderful. It was a great event. Uh, it was a wonderful energy. Um, it was very well attended. Uh, I, I went home with two, two pair of uh, custom sunglasses, um, which are excellent. Um, and, you know, I was able to have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with, with artists who were there who said, well, um, you know, I just wasn't really sure about the Affordable Care Act. I didn't know, you know, if it was for me. I wasn't sure if it would help me. Um, what's, what's it really all about? And so, you know, those are questions that we've been answering for the past, you know, couple of years. And I was able to say, look, this is the opportunity to buy private health insurance um, that meets some standards, you know, that's going to be comprehensive and cover what you need in a way that's affordable for you. So I was able to, you know, have those conversations one-on-one, -on -one, meet some people, and um, actually we just uh, planned um, a healthcare happy hour where I'm gonna, you know, come out to the gallery and be there for a couple hours on a Thursday evening um, in December, December 11th, to actually work one-on-one -on -one with artists who need help signing up for insurance. And I think um, one, of the, one of the things that became very apparent in, in um, what Sue was saying is that, you know, all of us make a lot of assumptions about, you know, other people and what they might believe or, or what they might know. And so I think it's really important always to be mindful of not making assumptions. And so um, it's, you know, it was interesting to hear some of the artists' perceptions about the Affordable Care Act, about it being a handout or about it being welfare. And I actually encountered that with some of my own activist friends who were currently volunteering to help other people learn about the law and connect up with coverage. And I... A couple of people who actually waited and didn't sign up themselves because they didn't want to, you know, take a handout. And that's absolutely not what the law is about. Um, it's about fairness. It's about making sure that, as a country, we're in this together. You know, that's the, the fundamental concept of insurance is that we all put in and then we take out at different times when we need care. So, you know, it's, it's actually a great, um, you know, that's what we should be doing across all areas in this country is, you know, working together. For, for the betterment of all. So um, I'm just excited. I've, I've probably gone on too long, which shows uh, how excited I am about working on this project, but I hope it's something that can continue, and um, it's just great. And I would definitely encourage you guys to, to go to Sue's blog and read the interviews, because they're really great. And it was it took me a long time to answer those questions. They, they were very good, but um, Sue has a real gift um, for, you know, for really drawing, you know, um, information that someone might be kind of guarded about, you know, to, to draw that out and um, share that with people. It was, it was really great. The interviews were, were wonderful, and it was, it was a great uh, learning process for me to go through and answer all those questions. So. Yeah, Sue 
his questions really uh, contextualized everything. The artists were able to really thoughtfully think about why they were involved and how their glasses affected them. So when they were working on their art pieces, I think they had even themselves a more thorough point of view or thoughts about it um, because of that structure. I think that was really important. And when I, the, all the proceeds from the eyeglass sales went to Healthy Artists, the non uh, it's a, Julie Socolo is an artist and she makes documentaries and she does art exhibits and stuff all centered around healthcare. And she works with a nonprofit. So funds went to her and the Bloomfield Garfield Corporation, which runs the Penn Avenue Arts Initiative, as well as other community driven initiatives in Garfield area where the art gallery is. So we were able to help artists and help organizations that help artists <laughs> all at the same time. One piece that was a takeaway for me that it took me a while to think about this, but you know, I, I, I really think it's true, is that I wasn't in a PR role. I mean, I certainly was. I did. I did do. I think one post, just sort of about the event, and, and that I tried to, to summarize it. And then in each of the interviews, of course, I linked to the event information. So obviously, I was trying to get people to participate. But it really, it really, you know, was an interesting experience where I entered the community project. You know, I wasn't just an observer. I wasn't just sort of in a quasi-journalist role. I, I was participating because in writing about it, I was creating something that was um, adding to the whole experience. And it, it, it was, just, you know, similar to storytelling. I was also trying to amplify the voices of the artists. And, and you know, the, a lot of the artists were visual artists or, or you know, performance artists. And um, not are, are not writers, right. and so this was an interesting experience of them having a chance to, to take their art and put their vision and put it into written form. And um, that was, you know, some of the not every artist participated. Some of them chose not to; they didn't want to. And not every artist needed prescription eyeglasses. A few of them were uh, participating and needed sunglasses. They were getting sunglasses, and so I asked them questions about their their growing up with people wearing glasses. And what kinds of experiences they had. Plus, you know, who was cool with sunglasses growing up? And those questions, no one said herbal. But, <laughs> um, but it, it really, it really changed me. This experience, in, in a way that few blogging experiences have. I spent probably a good month, maybe maybe six weeks on this. And we went to the gallery, um, opening my partner and I. And um, you know, Nina stapled all my. <laughs> interviews up on the walls, and, you know, my first art exhibit, so that was actually, it was kind of cool, and it was a really nice event, because everyone came running up to me, mm -hmm. they were like, you know, it felt like they were all like 12, and I'm just like, <laughs> oh my god, they're so young, but they just, you know, they, and they were talking about it, and you know, and just, it was just a really pleasant, nice, you know, activity, and you know, we ended up buying, not an art, not eyeglass thing, we bought something else <laughs> that uh, mine and husband put together, mm -hmm. and, um, when we left, I was telling Laura, my partner, I was, you know, I was like, that just was so nice, and it just felt so good, and, you know, I felt very much like welcomed and appreciated, and I was like, that's something everybody should get to experience when they participate in something, that, you know, there's, there's, there was no one who was like the premier artist or, or you know, the best artist. I mean, it was very much a collaborative, a collaborative effect. So yes, I'm, I'm embarrassed to ask this question, but. It, it, I'm just a little lost with something, and, and you guys can simply clarify it. Yeah. Everyone else may already get this. So, I am just, I'm trying to put, we're talking about a bunch of disparate things that have come together, which is, it sounds like it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And I realized that you blogged about it, and that you interviewed Erin, and that you interviewed people, the artists about this event. And I realized that you, in your gallery, together an event with these folks who develop eyeglasses or eyeglass store and you had artists develop artistic versions of 
various kinds of glasses, I guess, and they were this was all displayed in your gallery, mm -hmm. and that you interviewed these artists and also, but also talked about them and the event. But where does the Affordable Care Act piece, and I, I realize that you interviewed Aaron, yeah. but where does that piece come into this whole event? I think that that piece is um, moving forward to continue the relationship. So this, this event was a way to to broaden the, the relationships with, you know, to bring me into the picture, to be able to help artists who need health insurance to sign up for it and to be able to get that help in a setting that's comfortable and non-threatening for them. You know, to come out to an art gallery and be amongst a community of artists, get that information and get that help signing up. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing at this healthcare happy hour. Okay. And so then, so it's just kind of a, a there would be an art gallery and the opening with the eyeglasses, but then subsequently, or prior to that, you've been involved with these artists and others about educating them regarding the Affordable Care Act, which has been facilitated by the blocking. Yes, exactly. Okay. And, you know, and for, uh, you know, for artists and for many people that are self-employed, they're on their own, you know, in terms of finding health insurance. It doesn't come through an employer. And so, um, you know, hopefully, you know, I think, I think it's going to be a great partnership going forward just to, to be there in a setting that's comfortable for people to come and seek out information, be able to connect people with insurance. Because in many of the plans that are available under the health care law, um, certainly vision-related issues that are medically related um, are covered. Uh, most plans include the recommended routine eye exam once every two years. In most plans, they contribute something toward the cost of frames and lenses and contacts. So, um, you know, uh, vision insurance and dental, both, are not as comprehensive as they should be. And I think that's one of the next legs of the, you know, healthcare access fight is to improve those benefits. But there's at least some right now. And so we want to connect people, as many people as we can with that. Okay. So, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, so we started, the whole idea of partnering with Penn Avenue Eyewear sort of came out of the idea where my husband would not sign up for insurance. <laughs> like, I'll be honest. Like, I was having this really hard time explaining to him that he needed eyeglasses. And so, and, and then he was talking to one of our other artists, and they had a similar problem. And it was, it was one day it hit me that I knew all these people who needed eyeglasses and weren't sure what they were supposed to do. And through, and I didn't have the skills that I felt necessary really to educate them on what they needed to know. So with Sue's help, bringing in Aaron and like helping identify that they did have these problems and they didn't understand and that they there was access for them and they could get health insurance that might would help them with their eyeglasses. And so she's now been able to meet with these artists briefly at the event and then we'll do the healthy hour at the gallery where they can come and meet with her one-on-one -on -one and she can sign them up through her system and get them set up with the best plan for them. So it's like we've identified the problem, you know, and now we can, how do we fix it? How, and how, and then once we fix it for these people, how do we amplify that voice like Sue was saying, is saying we know that these artists have this problem. Other artists must also have this problem. Just from an outside observer coming in, I think that it's like amazing that the three of you put together, I mean, seriously, that just this just really creative but important, useful venue, whatever, whatever you want to call it, Gloria, I, I think it's really great. Oh, thank you. I'm going to cry. I'll get all emotional. <laughs> you guys are wonderful. <laughs> no, no, I'm just I'm shocked that, uh, first of all, like what I do is outreach and what you're doing is outreach yeah, right. on, on your behalf. This has found a way to get to a certain community with decision makers and certain ways. So I mean, it's perfect. I'm shocked that like uh, <laughs> that the like I haven't heard of this. I'm here at Pod Camp where there are right. 150 people come. You know why hasn't this presentation? Maybe you're practicing for something <laughs> bigger. But you know I'm shocked that this presentation is done somewhere else about outreach about healthcare. Yeah. You know, because, oh. or, or why haven't I seen it on a news story? Absolutely. Point, you know, I'm, I'm shocked. That's where I think the blog.
blogger, blogging format, John, you're a blogger, and I know that you write humor, but you do occasionally delve into some serious issues. That's where I think we, as citizen journalists or community-based writers, can really reach different people who may not it just have been reached. Because obviously any organization doing outreach has limits and constraints, especially when you're dealing with the entire population of Pennsylvania. That's a lot of people to connect with. So there are multiple opportunities. You know, I, I'm a lesbian blogger. I blog about LGBT issues. I, I, I do lots of different kinds of things. But I'm not a healthcare blogger. There really is no such thing. I, I don't think I know of any healthcare blogs that aren't run by healthcare companies, which are different. And, you know, but there's no reason that other kinds of bloggers couldn't do something similar and perhaps make contact with people who otherwise might not have access to that information. So off the top of my head, I'm thinking, you know, the sports bloggers, you know, maybe there's an opportunity there for them to talk about, um, you know, healthcare in the context of injuries. Right. Yeah, you're... That's exactly kind of where I was headed. I used to, uh, as a paramedic, I used to work the golf outings, the Mario Lemieux Foundation outing, and these pro golfers would come through. And most golfers, people don't know, live in their car right. because they don't make any money. And then the caddies are even worse. Right. So they would come, we would do the medical coverage, and the caddies, as they passed through town, so they were in Pittsburgh this particular weekend, they would come to the medical tent and have their tooth checked or have their right. diabetic sore on their toe checked because they did not have health care. Right. And uh, and so we would become those, they, we would be their health care provider as they pass through town each year. Right. And uh, so I could see this almost, yeah. you have this subset of, uh, of artists, there's a subset of caddies, there's a subset yeah. of every, wow. yeah, every sure. aspect yeah. uh, that's but kind I, of interesting. But I can see that the host of a premier golfing event isn't going to want a health access group set up there advertising the fact. No doubt about it. Right. That's exactly right. But there's no reason that the EMTs who are there can't give a flyer mm -hmm. right. to every person who comes but through. But you made it comfortable for an artist to admit that I am lacking something in my life. Right. You made it, you brought them in. So, you know, uh, you're going to have beer and whatever. You know, so <laughs> people are going to people are going to come there and they're going to talk about it. Like, it's like, it's, you know, it, it, but you made it, you made it in their world where they didn't have to come to your office. I mean, I don't go sign up for a, I was in a position where I probably needed to sign up for, for a food cart, and I didn't, because I didn't physically want to go anywhere to do that. And, uh, but if I was someplace at an art gallery and you were saying, by the way, uh, you know, I might be more apt to do that as an artist. So I think that's really an incredible outreach activity. And I'm not trying to put the, I'm putting in my context, and that's exactly what it is, it's outreach. And you make it cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really incredible. I think the other thing that's important to remember is that we didn't know any of this. I mean, right. I mean, obviously, Erin knew all the stuff that she knew. And Nina had that general sense mm -hmm. of people, but you know, she wasn't putting in a blog post about her husband, although now she's right. put it on the internet. I so know, I guess. <laughs> but um, there's this, you know, it, it, and I didn't know this. And I didn't go looking for the information. It was a chance, a, a question of saying, why is this important to you? Why are you participating? Can you, know, can you tell us how, um, I think the question I asked specifically was how a lack of um, access to eye vision or health care or something like that affects your life. And that's where the answers came from. So part of the, part of, you know, the credit, most of the credit goes to the artists because they really opened themselves up and shared in, in some cases, stories that, you know, might have been difficult or, or it's hard to remember, you know, recall or, or even necessarily, not necessarily something they want to share, but they did. And it was because we asked certain questions and then we took a look at the answers and we saw patterns, you know. And I think this is in healthcare, you know, a common thing that, for example, they ask healthcare providers to make, you know, to screen for domestic violence. That makes a difference. Asking someone. And, you know, not just assuming that because they're well-dressed and have a decent car that they don't need help with food stamps, you know, and, and but not asking them in a way that's stigmatizing. Right. You know, I certainly didn't say, oh, do you have health insurance? You know, I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, I was careful how I went about doing it. And so 
I think that there's a lot of opportunity to take this particular solution out to people, but others as well. I think, you know, for artists in general, there, there might be other needs. That's awesome. How did you, how did people find your blog? I mean, what, what was, because you can blog if nobody's going to read it, then, or nobody is within... Well, to be fair, I'm not trying to be, I don't want to be cocky about it, but I have been blogging for nine years, okay. so I did have an established base. Um, and I, what we did in that case is Nina was taking the blog posts I wrote and sharing them in the arts community, and then they were spreading around. And um, one of the particip participating artists, uh, Devon Madwood, who is a, a comedian, has a very substantial following on Twitter because he likes to argue with the Westboro Baptist Church yeah. a lot. And so he is over 10,000 followers. Yeah. So since he was participating, he was really, yeah, it's not always pretty, but, yeah. but he was sharing it. John shared. John has a lot of followers, and he and I, you know, are connected, and the things that caught his eye, you know, and the other thing is, is I have relationships with John and other bloggers, and so when something important comes up, I can say, hey, will you please share this, and they always do, to be, you know, good sports, and, you know, and so it was a combination of just my native organic audience, the bloggers being, I mean, the artists being excited about their own posts and sharing right. them with their friends. Nina was a relentless machine mm -hmm. of uh, promoting. And, um, and both the nonprofits, Healthy Artists and Winfield Garfield, they shared it too. So it got out. We had enough people, a lot of different types of people and groups participating. So you, we were able to, I think, get it out to a lot of different communities. How many, how many people uh, participated in this particular event, would you say? As far as the artists were concerned, yeah. I think it ended up being. 24 artists total, and they were able to get glasses. It was about a 50-50 split on the ones who got prescription lenses in their frames and the ones who decided they either wanted clear frames or computer lenses or sunglass lenses. Is there art any better now that they have glasses? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to do a follow-up and maybe people can rate it. Right. <laughs> well, um, just heading back to that other question real quick, the one thing I also wanted to say is we did use social media quite a bit, and Facebook was a, a strong source. Pittsburgh loves Facebook because, you know, we're always 10 years behind, yeah. and, and um, the gay community very, very much uses Facebook, much more than the average community. Um, so that's where my major base is, but I took a lot of effort to put everything on, um, of course, on Twitter, but also on Instagram and Pinterest. And I was really surprised. Now, on Insta, now again, Devon's on Instagram with 8,000 yeah. followers, but he, he, he can't share on Instagram. But but because the artists were sending me, you know, they, I made them give me a photo, you know, and some of them resisted. <laughs> but we, um, in a couple, you know, sometimes it was a creative interpretation of themselves, and I would put that was perfect for Instagram, you know, and I just made sure it was the right size. And then on Pinterest, the same thing. And so, really, we tried, and we used, we, I said to Nina, we have to pick a hashtag. Yeah. That's my number one question now. What's the hashtag? And, you know, we really um, worked pretty hard to have that consistent social media presence across. And Tumblr. I was putting it on Tumblr. I don't have a lot of followers on Tumblr, but still. It was we made the hashtag the name. Yeah. <laughs> well, hashtag well, artistic well, vision. Well, I've got quite a few more experience with this than me. I'm really very much a novice. So I'm curious why. Because I heard in some other class, and I sense misunderstood, that hashtags really were not that important. But on TV, it looks like everybody has a hashtag. So why was that important? Uh, for tracking. Because yes. I was I needed to measure impact. And so, because I wanted to see if, you know, to be honest with you, part of it was for me to see was it worth my time. Because... You know, if I broke down my hourly rate versus the price of the glasses, I spent, I put way more time into it than the glasses would, you know, as a barter. But, but you know, that was a choice I made, which is fine, but I wanted to look and see what kind of impact are we having. So with a hashtag, I can track shares, follows, clicks, retweets, and, you know, I have some professional tools that I use, so it's a little bit easier for me. Um, Instagram hashtags are the thing. You have to use hashtags on Instagram. And, you know, you got to make up funky... Yeah, it definitely helps. And, yeah. 
you know, on Facebook, I use them just for simplicity, again, so I could track it a little bit, but it really, you know, I don't think anyone else was heavily looking for that hashtag, but me um, and Nina to some extent, but I was, it was more that I was tagging people in each, so, you know, when I put up Devon's piece on Twitter, I made sure to tag him and Nina and Most Wanted, Most Wanted, and yeah. I wear and the hashtag. Yeah. And what does Tumblr do again? Tumblr's like a blogging system, but it is in and of itself that, yeah, um, you, you can post videos, links, images, quotes, stories, and people can reshare them. Um, Easy reshare. Yeah. It's, you it's, can reshare it onto your own blog very easily. And it's, so you can actually have a blog on Tumblr, and you're using their platform, but you, you know, as opposed to just having an account. So, because you can set up a template and your layout and everything, so it's kind of like a built-in software system to use. And, but it's not as popular. Well, it all depends because you know Tumblr is popular with certain demographics, um, and. You know, Facebook is the most popular, but losing ground. But it's not as if Tumblr is going to overtake Facebook in the next few years. Um, I personally, I do use Tumblr some, but I have learned certain things are very popular in Tumblr for me, and other things are not. And it's just a matter of a time, of having the time, taking the time, because I try to blog daily. So to sh share it on all those platforms is a lot of effort. If you're looking for a cheat, though, on Instagram, you can share to your Twitter, your Facebook, and your Tumblr all at the same time. So if you can get all your important information into that little tiny Instagram frame, you can post to all of it at the same time. <laughs> but it also, the other thing with the hashtag is that it creates an archive. So that, you know, I can run a Twitter feed using that hashtag and... Um, if we do it next year, I can highlight all the, you know, because our hashtag was, uh, was Artistic Vision PGH, so it was unique, and probably nobody else is going to use that. Yeah. But if they do, they'll probably check first, and they'll see what it's associated mm -hmm. with, right. you know, and, and, it's, and so that, that can help for people in the future to say, wow, look at all this content they generated last year. Yes, we should be their corporate sponsor and give them $10,000 for this project, too. Right. I exams for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you guys should really contact like a STEM winning thing. I'm telling you, I, I, you should be on the Ellen show. Yeah. I'm not kidding. I mean, yeah. this is the kind of stuff that she really rewards. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's it's very unique. I'm not kidding. I mean, I'm not no, just saying that because we're the ones in here. Like, this is the kind of stuff she then sits and says, well, I'm going to give you a check for $50,000 to get everybody yeah. class. Right. Right. Other, other galleries or build your gallery or other, you know. Or get grants. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Or go on, like, start sure. locally. Start with, like, contact well, Dave College I just can't or believe it. Yeah. At CBS. We did talk about expanding beyond most wanted fine arts artists. Once we try that, you know. And I'm going to be continuing to participate as the blogger of this, but to... Mm -hmm to um, then reach out through other arts groups and other small galleries yeah. and um, invite them. Because there's not like it's like a, you know, loyalty thing about crossing the boundary. Crossing the river might be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And even working with the crafting community with some of the um, handmade arcade and I made market and just yeah, the people who are in a similar situation. And, mm -hmm. and then, you know, Erin will go wherever somebody wants her to to talk to whomever mm -hmm. he's talking to. Yeah, so she could, so if you could sneak her in that caddy tent, John, you know. <laughs> yeah, could, uh, yeah, that's, I, mean, I don't even do that anymore, but, but I was fascinated by that world, yeah. you know, it's mm -hmm. such an underground, healthy world. I didn't realize yeah. that at all, yeah. that that is, like, really, because I think of golfers as being the same. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Four of them are. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> exactly right, yeah. It's yeah. like, you know, I was thinking they're actors, I mean, they, they always so, are underserved by everything. Yeah. Photographers, yeah. like anybody yeah. who's in yeah. kind of the more creative-ish, but no real employer. But I think there's two, I mean, there's there's maybe a perception that because they're so skilled in their art that there's no need to go in, you know, right. in, a, in a targeted way into those communities, and there definitely is, because yeah. it's, it's perplexing and new, you know, for everybody, so we're just excited, and you know, like Sue said, I have pack up and go where <laughs> as many places awesome. as I can get to. I memorized your cell phone because I give it out to people, so I'll have to. <laughs> 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 I 
one of the artists was a photographer and she took the photos and then the videographer and then the bond was as a comedian he performed at the event like we really tried to incorporate all types of artists So then they, and that, that is, is Medicaid then. They are collecting 
using Medicaid? So it's, this is why healthcare yeah. is complicated. So in Pennsylvania and in many other states, even though someone um, is eligible for Medicaid, they still actually get their benefits through a private health insurance company. So even in Pennsylvania right now, the people that are on Medicaid um, get their coverage through UPMC or Highmark oh, nice. or Gateway or United, and that's how it's going to be under the Medicaid expansion as well. So most states have moved toward a privatized model where even though someone's eligible for Medicaid, the benefits still come through private insurance companies. Okay. And there's another challenge that I hear that you know, we'll have to tackle at some point. It's this perception that taking a handout is a bad thing. Thank you. And yeah. so, mm -hmm. you know, that... There is that stigma. Because it's, 